Beyond Meat, a premium vegan food company listed on the New York Stock Exchange earlier this year. The company was able to attract a list investors to fund the uh, first veggie meat public company. Vegan lifestyle products are a growing industry in the country with mainstream grocers cashing in on the growing trend. But really, how big is the industry and how importantly, how much growth rather can we expect? Before we unpack this uh, further, let's take a look at this market analysis from the CNBC News Desk. They are projecting a total sales this year of $210 million, which is slightly higher, and EBITDA break even by the end of the year. And I saw one other number in here that jumped out. Gross profit for the quarter was $10.8 million, uh, or almost 27% as a percentage of revenues. And that is compared to $2.1 million a year ago. So their gross profit up 400 percent. I think May 2nd was an epiphany moment uh, for the industry. We witnessed 33 million cows rejoice. They ran out. They called their brokers planning for retirement because they realize they're going to have a life beyond two or three. That's just ridiculous. Cows don't use the phone. They use email. Everyone knows that. Or they go online, as my kids would say. But, yeah, but I mean, here's the problem of Beyond Meat. Their success is so great, but the, yet they're saying we don't know if we can meet demand. Look, Why should we own a company that says we don't know if we can supply our customers? Look, it's a high class problem. I think you had situations last summer where you had consumers going into their retailers, into, into grocery stores, hoarding product when deliveries were, were made. But I think you got a really smart management team. They've taken the right moves. They're planning for future expansion. They know uh, how to meet demand. And I think the things to watch here in the future are going to be continuing to watch gross margins. I think the gross margins that were reported yesterday at about 27 percent were quite remarkable. If you weigh that against other traditional uh, animal meat products in a grocery store, you see high single digit gross margins, maybe low double digit margins if it's a branded product. Here we got a company that's going to have gross margins when they hit scale in the mid 30 percent. The margins come when there is scarcity or scarcity of demand, but yet you've got Impossible Burger, you've got Nestle coming out earlier this week. The stock took a hit, by the way, in the news. Nestle's thinking about coming out with their own sort of plant-based burger. Can it's Beyond Meat increase, survive competition? The market. Can they survive competition? It's going to broaden the market. I think they're the market leader, in my opinion. I think they have a more remarkable product than some of their competitors. And I think you have tremendous upside in the stock. Uh, you, we're going to see hopefully more announcements about more chains adding, adding meat. And I think that, you know, coming into the end of the next year, you can actually actually see analysts talking about uh, this company having a billion dollar run rate going into 2021 and beyond. But why not release more stock? I mean, I, I did a comparison a couple weeks ago on the show that, you know, at a market cap of five billion, most companies have 150 to 200 million shares outstanding. It's got 57 million shares of stock. Why not release more stock? It's probably not a good corporate finance uh, idea. I mean, you're going to finance what you need at the point in time. Any, any founder and inside team is going to manage dilution. So they financed what they need. They're looking at their capital requirements and capital needs going out. And they're probably also managing that against the backdrop of future profitability and what their CapEx requirements are going to be over the next Are you months. even surprised? I mean, you're an early investor, so obviously you're optimistic on the company. But are you even surprised I, I by actually, this kind of reaction? Uh, look, I actually increased my personal position by 50% when this when? started trading after the IPO. Really? So, so um, you got in before and after the I IPO? I bought before the IPO, and um, I, I invested last year, and I even increased my position by 50% personally. So and you still got it. You're, still hold, you're holding I, on. I'm, I'm still holding. Yep. Beyond meat. So I think, it's, Segundo, I think it's a California. remarkable company, and it's got a remarkable future. They're going to be able to increase production. Yes, I think they'll be able to increase production. I think that Wall Street has uh, forecast light for both this year, I think you got most analysts talking about a $210 million a year. I think that that could come in more closer to 250. And I think next year's numbers, I think we're going to have a lot of upside surprises. Well, that was a special hot stocks report from CNBC. And joining us via Skype for more is Peter Haldenhays, uh, who is a tour guide to the future and visiting lecturer at the London Business School. Peter, thanks so much for your time. I mean, just listening to my colleagues there in the U.S. talking about this big and growing demand for vegan-based products. Uh, do you think that the African, and specific, specifically rather the South African consumer, is similar to that of the U.S., uh, who is, you know, um, ready to ditch the barbecue for plant-based alternatives? I, I think there's a segment of the South African population that will definitely adhere to these, these, these new trends. But it's really important to realize is that these aren't really vegans that take up the Beyond Meat product. 
Um, there, there are two debates currently happening in the world of diet. On the one side, we've got the uh, high-fat, low-carb school, um, and this is the ketone movement that, that focuses truly on reducing glucose and ensure that you have more ketones in your body to reduce insulin. On the other end, you've got your uh, low-fat, high-carb adherence, and the problem is that they both support their position via scientific study. Now, the, the, the overlap between these two mindsets is a very slim, thin sliver. And these are products like mushrooms and avocados and olive oil and mushrooms and salmon, not really a huge choice. And what we are seeing is that Beyond Meat are taking these products that, that, that's within this overlap and they're creating meat-like substitutes. And a number of people are now saying, maybe this is a very good choice where we can utilize these meat-like products rather than falling into one of these pre-existing categories. I mean, I must say, I've probably tried every single diet under the sun, and I'm wondering what the, um, the Beyond Meat-like products would uh, be in terms of their carb content, because I know that um, sort of non-meat uh, alternatives use other things in the form or that are higher in carbohydrates. But the question that I want to get to you is, um, outside of a diet perspective, I imagine that these alternative products will be a lot more expensive. And I'm wondering what the demand or the uptake like would be for your typical South African consumer. As I said, I think there's a segment of the, of the base that would do it. Uh, so small, it's a, so relatively well, small maybe. Well, right now, the price is slightly higher than normal meat. This means that it's a selected group. But as new competitors will enter the market, we will see that the necessary price drops will, will come into play and that a higher percentage of the population will adhere to it. The, the thing beyond, of Beyond Meat is that their products taste like meat. And this means that a bigger part of the population is open to, to testing this. And I think with more competitors, if they have the same taste and texture, then Beyond Meat, we will definitely see a larger part of the population uh, looking at this as an alternative to meat. And I mean, is it is it really all about health and this growing trend for a lot more people to be healthier, essentially? Is that what's driving this demand? Uh, I, I think a small segment might look at novelty, but I do think that health is important. Um, people are saying, but we don't really know who to trust. Uh, would it be the, the one group, the ketotarian group, or the traditional low-fat group? And this is a safe alternative because it adheres to both of these philosophies. But I'm also wondering, though, is uh, does it have a possibility or a chance or risk of just being a fad? Because you know how diet is. You try one thing and, oh, that goes out of fashion, and then let's try intermittent fasting, which then goes out of fa fashion, and then let's try that. I'm just wondering the, the longevity or the sustainability of this group of people that you're talking about in this, in this vegan segment. What's really interesting is that this specific product of Beyond Meat falls into both of these segments, and therefore I believe it will have a longer a longevity than some of the other products. I think they've got a, a winning recipe right here. And, but I suppose also, I mean, we know that the population is increasing um, and we need to be looking at other alternate uh, or, or sources of a food to feed this growing population. That could also be a, quite a strong uh, case for the, the, the sustainability and I suppose, I suppose the entry of, of, of new uh, manufacturers like this that give us an alternative source of food. You're 100% correct. If we take a look at Africa, we are seeing with our current 1.2 billion people on the, on, on the continent, this is going to increase to about 4 billion people by 2100. We will have to take a look at alternative sources of nutrition. And with these type of products, we might be able to provide meat-like products to a far larger pop a group of people than what is possible today. And uh, we do hope that more companies will enter this phrase and also bring down the price. Are there any environmental risks, though, um, to the vegetables um, as eating a lot more of them in terms of a sustainability point of view? Or does the argument not stand as, as strongly as it does when it comes to the, the, the killing of animals? Well, I, I think that uh, you need about 10 kilograms of grain for one kilogram of protein. Um, and we, we won't That's know what the long term That is, that is. Uh, fish is actually far better. Um, but if we take a look at mushrooms and peas, which is presumably what which is, forms part of this uh, Beyond Meat product, 
um, it, it requires far less cost and has got a far smaller footprint, environmental footprint, uh, to make than, than traditional meat. So um, if we can get a, a good supplement for protein, and I think there's enough protein in, in mushrooms, we do believe that this product uh, is, is quite uniquely positioned to fulfill those needs. Yeah, and then of course there's also the environmental or the, the weather aspect of it. I mean, when you look at what the drought has, has done to food security as well on the continent. You're completely correct. And I do believe that we need to take a look at technology to sustain a far a higher growing population worldwide, specifically in Africa, because Africa is going to be the continent that's going to explode in the next couple of decades. Certainly, Peter, let's leave it there. That was Peter Haldenhays, a tour guide to the future and the visiting lecturer at the London Business School.